Anne, anytime you're ready, everybody, I'm recording this. Good day. I am Ann Mazakowski, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County, I want to thank you for joining us for our hot topic, the election, the aftermath, what comes next. The mission of the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization, encourages informed and active participation in citizenship, elections, and democracy, and works to increase the understanding of major public policy issues to influence public policy through education and advocacy. One of the ways we help fulfill our mission is to offer presentations to inform the public and voters on the importance of defending our democracy and exercising your right to vote. Over the past few months, our presentations have focused on the 2020 general election. Presentations included election law, process and security, presented by League members Jodine Mayberry and Jamie Mogul. Sorting news from noise, featuring Aaron Sharakman, Executive Director of PolitiFact of the Pointer Institute, and it was co-sponsored by the NAACP Media Branch. The 2020 election, the politics of the divided America, presented by Dr. G. Terry Madonna, nationally recognized political pollster and commentator and director of the Center for Politics and Public Affairs at Franklin and Marshall College. We also held four virtual candidate forums, which were coordinated with other leagues, including the League of Women Voters of Radnor Township, Lower Marion and Arbeth, and the Chester County League. At the end of the presentation, I would like to share our upcoming events. Also, we are recording this event, and a link to the recording will be sent to those that registered. If you are a member of the League of Women Voters, we thank you for your support. But if you are not a member and would like to join us to, to move forward our mission, visit our website, lwvcdc.org. Today's program, The Election, The Aftermath, What Comes Next, features two League of Women Voter members, Jack Nagel and Jamie Mogul. Jack Nagel, University of Pennsylvania Professor Emeritus of Political Science, and Jamie Mogul, election rights lawyer, will present this topic from a League pers perspective. The questions that were submitted prior to the event were shared with Jack and Jamie, and our question moderator today is Kathy Youngman, board member of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County and professor of communications at Cabrini University. Kathy. Um, I am recording this and we'll put it up on our, um, on our uh, site after the session is done. Um, if you would like to see just a speaker, you can put your um, computer in speaker view, your Zoom in speaker view, and then you can just see who uh, is speaking. If you wanna see everybody, you can keep it in gallery view. I'm gonna run a poll at the very beginning of this session just to get some feedback from you. And then we'll run the same poll at the end and compare the results to see if there has been any change of heart after the presentation of our speakers. We have um, received a ton of questions about the election ahead of time when you guys registered for this session. If you think of, of questions um, uh, that you would like to ask during the presentation, please feel free to put it in the chat. Our two speakers can see that and um, they'll be able to answer them or we can interject them at the end we have time. So I'm going to turn it over now to our two guests, uh, Jamie and Jack. I want to hear all about the election and its aftermath. Great. Well, Jack, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? I, I guess Thanks, everybody. Uh, I think uh, I might as well start uh, with some discussion of the Electoral College, both because we had a lot of questions about that and because it's obviously central to uh, how we choose our presidents. 
Uh, but even beyond that, uh, a lot of our discussion is going to be about the current dispute or attempted dispute over the results. And, and really, there is only a dispute because of the Electoral College. But, uh, and, and before we get dive deep right into it, Jack, I am going to say, I just want to please take a moment for all of us to consider the positive aspect of this election, particularly in uh, Delco and um, all 67 counties, uh, a major election, no instances of fraud during a pandemic with new voting reforms, you know, in Delco using new voting machines. Um, I think there's just a tremendous um, debt of gratitude that we owe to our election administrators, the staff, the poll workers, um, so I, th I think we need to start off by talking about good news. And that is, you know, look, I, I've run election protection and you wait for those calls about you know, machines down and crazy lines. And so I think we need to emphasize the positive here, which is we had a very good election day and election week. Yes, things are still pending, uh, which we'll be talking about today. But I think we need to, uh, to emphasize that positive uh, result. So. And if if it's okay, I can can I run the poll now? I forgot to put oh, it. Oh yes, yes, yes. Run the poll. <laughs> so those of you who are um, on phone will not be able to answer this poll. But if the rest of you could please just answer this question: How do you think the election of the president will be resolved? It will end up in the United. Well, that, no. Please mute yourself if you're not one of our two presenters. Viola, could you please mute yourself? Oh boy, we have 90% uh, of people have answered. <laughs> And All Jack, right. did you want me to talk about, we got a good question about the role of the league or do you want to wait till afterwards? Let, for me let's, let me just that. share the results uh, of this oh, poll and then I'm going to end the poll and I'll share the results so you guys can all see it. Before this talk, before <laughs> this presentation, 96% um, of you thought that this election will be resolved by the Electoral College. Nobody thought it was going to make it to the House of Representatives, and uh, two people thought it will end up in the Supreme Court. So, savvy leaguers. Savvy leaguers. <laughs> okay, Jamie, I'll turn it back over to you and Jack. Oh, okay. So I, I was mentioning that we owe a great debt uh, to all of our election administrators who are still um, in court and still counting votes and canvassing. Uh, so. There is good news, though, that without any major hiccups, we had a very good election weeks, all right? Because it, it was like an election season. It wasn't uh, an election day. So a lot to be owed, particularly in uh, in Delco with new machines. And I know the leagues, we were all we were doing all we could to support the administration of elections. But what's led us to here? I'm going to talk about um, some of the legal challenges and some of these pending lawsuits. And Jack's going to take it away because we got a lot of questions about the Electoral College. Of course, Pennsylvania, we're not just on the national map, we're on the world map that people are looking to what's happening here in Pennsylvania. Uh, not, all of it's, not all of it's good, but uh, hopefully we can have a good conversation and you can go back and tell your friends and your family um, not to stoke the paranoia uh, and the fears and anxieties that I think are, are surrounding this election. So I'm going to have Jack kind of take it away about what's the Electoral College and particularly then we'll talk about Pennsylvania. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, and I want to second what you said about the outstanding performance of election officials and all the volunteers in the polls from what I've heard and what I've read about. Uh, but we do have a dispute uh, led by President Trump and his allies, and uh, I want to talk about the Electoral College because it provides the framework for that dispute, 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, there wouldn't be a dispute if it were not for the Electoral College, because the popular vote margin at 5 million and counting is, is, is so large that uh, there wouldn't be any question about it. It's one of the less understood features of the Electoral College that it actually greatly increases the likelihood of disputes, because the, the probability of a margin that would be disputable for the nation as a whole is much less than the likelihood that you would have a margin in critical battleground states that is close enough uh, to have an argument about. And that's what we've got uh, this year. Now, as you know, um, it takes 270 electoral votes to win. That's an absolute majority of the total of 538, and that's part of the Constitution. Uh, so the goal of the uh, disputes uh, that uh, President Trump is raising is either two things. One is to flip enough states so that uh, Biden's lead will go below 270. In fact, he, Trump himself, will get over 270. Or the other would be to uh, prevent votes from being cast in some enough states so uh, that the margin would, that Biden's total would be less than 270. And that can happen if certain states' votes are not certified or if there's a dispute about rival slates uh, so that uh, Congress doesn't know which to accept. Now, if no candidate reaches the magic number of uh, 270, what happens? Well, there we go to, under the Constitution to what's called the contingent process. Uh, it was mentioned in the poll, this resolution by the House of Representatives. This would be the newly elected House, the one that takes its office in January. And in the contingent process, each state's delegation gets only one vote, one vote for California, one vote for Wyoming or Delaware. And in fact, states that are evenly divided in their delegations, like Pennsylvania, uh, won't even vote at all unless some member uh, abstains or defects to the other side. Now, within that House vote, an absolute majority is again required for victory. So that means 26 states uh, must vote in favor of a winner. This process was actually used in 1800 and 1824. Fortunately, we haven't had it used since. What would happen if it were uh, resorted to in 2021? Well, uh, Republicans control 26 or 27 House delegations. There's a little doubt about Iowa at the moment. That includes two delegations where uh, Biden leads in the, in the uh, presidential vote, Georgia and Wisconsin. And three, uh, there are three states that Biden won that are currently evenly split, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Michigan. So the Democrats control only uh, 20 delegations, uh, Republicans at least 26. Uh, so President Trump would almost certainly win a contingent election in the House unless uh, a lot of Republican members of Congress had uh, attacks of conscience about overthrowing a popular vote winner. What would it take uh, for uh, President Trump either to get himself the majority of uh, electoral votes or to throw Biden's lead below that majority so that it goes into the House? Well, uh, uh, Joe Biden leads in states currently with 306 electoral votes. So the challenges must flip or remove from the count states with 37 or more electoral votes to get down to 269 or below. Uh, Biden leads in six states where the margins are close enough to challenge. And that's with their electoral votes, Georgia with 16, Arizona 11, Pennsylvania 20, Wisconsin 10, Nevada 6, and Michigan 16. Now, if you do the arithmetic on those numbers, uh, President Trump's challenges must overturn the results in at least three states to get to 37 or more. So it's not enough for a challenge to succeed in one or two states. He's got to get a trifecta. Uh, how essential is Pennsylvania to these challenges? It's not entirely essential. Uh, the group of Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin would total 37 votes. There are several combinations involving Michigan, uh, but the Michigan margin in the current popular vote is much larger than in Pennsylvania. So, so it doesn't seem likely that the Michigan result would be overturned. So Pennsylvania is a big target of the challenges. Now, what are the ways that a result might be overturned? There are really two ways, recounts or court challenges. 
The recounts depend on more ways, Jamie. <laughs> I'm just saying, let's, let's, we'll, we'll get to that. But I, I think uh, I'm going to prompt you because we got questions about this, particularly Pennsylvania. I think some of you might have seen the PA GOP leader was quoted in an Atlantic article. So this, this has been stirring for quite a while. So Jack, I want to ask you, and we got questions about this. Does the state legislature as their, um, now it's not all of GOP, I would say sometimes it's, uh, they have factions within their own party. That they're claiming that you know that they would have a say in designating electors is that possible and what what could happen uh in pennsylvania because i think a lot of people watch cable news and they think uh they hear about this well actually i was going to throw that question back to you jamie uh, the lawyer <laughs> well i i can answer it too i, I can give I, you I, a, I think an we're answer. going there yeah <laughs> Well, well, certainly I, I can answer, but I think you lay it out this trifecta of numbers um, and, and the math, whether it's the votes or the how it works here in Pennsylvania, it's I, I want to be very clear about this. The legislature cannot designate. OK, it is votes that are certified by the secretary of state and the electors from the respective parties are already chosen. And so that's certified and then it goes to the governor to sign off on. So this is, you know, for lack of better words, a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, I do think it's to undermine the integrity of our democracy and our system and kind of stoke these fears of a coup. Uh, Pennsylvania is not a good target for them. Uh, yes, we do have a GOP led legislature and they seem to be dangling this carrot like they can actually do something um, and that does go to delays which, which jack mentioned um meaning they can push things off so maybe jack i answered that as to how our how it works in pennsylvania but maybe you can explain the timeline for people because this has been coming up as well uh, what does it mean when are electors chosen when does it go to uh the to Congress, if it goes to Congress, and when when do we have a new president? So maybe you can explain the timeline for people, because I think there's confusion around that as well. Yeah, uh, well, the the first step, which occurs in each state is for the state authorities to certify a victor. And then that would lead to the selection of the slate of electors supporting that candidate. The deadlines vary in the states uh, as to when the certification has to occur. I think the earliest is Georgia among the disputed states. Uh, the earliest, I think, is Georgia on November 20th, and then some of the others go as late as December 1st. Uh, there's a national requirement that certification occur by December 8th, I believe. Now, uh, once the certification has happened, the electors will cast their votes officially on December 14th, they meet in each state separately. That's part of the original constitutional arrangement of the Electoral College. So they don't all ever meet together as a group, except that the Pennsylvania electors will meet in Harrisburg, the New Jersey electors in Trenton, and so forth. And uh, they cast their votes at that time. Uh, then the votes will be presented to the new Congress uh, right after it convenes, January 3rd, I think, and uh, Congress either accepts or uh, if there's a dispute about votes from uh, slates of electors from a particular state, then Congress would have to try to resolve that dispute. So that's one way that things might get hung up uh, and, and part of the fairly desperate strategy might be aimed at that. Yeah, that's, um, I think, uh hearing that we have a system of checks and balances and a system in place is very important for people to hear. We did get a good question about electors, right? The, the names themselves sounds like they're elected. Um, maybe you can explain or you want me to explain who are the electors um, for each of the respective uh, political parties? Well, I couldn't name a single one. I haven't looked that I up. I do know <laughs> some. <laughs> Uh, but generally, each party designates a slate of electors that consists of uh, party uh, loyalties, people, loyalists, people with some distinction in, in the party or service to the party. Uh, and it's an honor to them to, to serve as an elector. 
uh, if you really are interested in an inside view of what it's like to be in a lecture, you might want to book, uh, read a book written a long time ago by James Michener, the novelist, who was an elector from Pennsylvania in 1968. And of course, being an author, he wrote a book about it. Uh, so that gives you the inside view. But uh, Jamie, do you know some of the electors on each slate in Pennsylvania right now? Yeah, so it's usually made up of, like you said, um, party leaders. And uh, there's another thing that came up, uh, somebody asked us in questions about, uh, you know, what if you have somebody who defects? Uh, so that means like they go along and yes, they're supposed to be party faithful. And in this case, if you were a Democrat uh, casting your vote for the Biden ticket and so forth, what if you didn't choose Biden? Um, Pennsylvania isn't one of these states, but uh, you are required to, I mean, this is why you choose party faithful, because uh, they do choose that. Um, there is different states rules. Um, some states even make it a, a crime, right? You can be punished uh, if you don't go along with uh, who has won, you know, the majority. Uh, but it here in Pennsylvania, I don't think this is something, this was another thing I was told came up on the news. I don't watch cable news, but I get lots of texts and emails and calls about what is coming up and all kinds of data, because I love data. I guess there's this guy, Steve Karnacki, people are obsessed with him, uh, but I'm all about data too. Uh, so maybe one day I'll be on there. But the point is that Pennsylvania, this isn't something that we should perpetuate, that people would change their minds, right, Jack? I, I don't think that that's uh, an issue here. I don't think in Pennsylvania, it, it has happened and uh, fairly often, but not ever so far in a way that affected an outcome. They're just usually just a handful of people who want to be so-called faithless electors. Now in 2016, there were quite a number of them. Yes. <laughs> in Colorado, uh, when one elector announced the intention to not vote for Hillary Clinton, uh, that person was replaced by somebody who would. Uh, and that led to a court case that went to the Supreme Court. And there was another uh, several electors in Washington state uh, who were faithless last time uh, for reasons of their own. Uh, and, and there was another case that went to the court and uh, th that would be in Jamie's uh, bailiwick, but uh, the- yeah. So each state, like I said, has their own rules. It went to the Supreme Court because it, the question was, do the electors as general, are they allowed to replace that person? Are they allowed to even punish that person, like find them? Um, and that was held, uh, that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, so. I know we're gonna get into some alternatives to the electoral college. I think everybody understands this is our current system. Uh, our 20 votes are very important here in Pennsylvania. Um, like I said, it was national news that our PA GOP leader, there's been press conferences by the PA uh, GOP legislature, not all of them, I should say, um, uh, but that they seem to intimate that they'll ha be able to change things and because of this delay or recount, like Jack said. So Jack, is there anything else you wanna add about that before we move into maybe some of the legal challenges and then we're we'll have Jack talk about some of the alternatives because I think people are really excited and this is a great role that I believe the league will play a part in in advocating um, for an alternative to the electoral college. Uh, um, well, we might say a little bit about recounts. Um, mm -hmm. Recounts are governed by state law and each uh, state has different provisions as to whether they even allow recounts, whether they are automatic uh, or whether candidates can request them. And there's usually a, a trigger or a threshold. So the vote has to be within a certain margin. And sometimes those margins are very tight. So there's already- I, I've worked on recounts. They're, mm -hmm. they're... They're very interesting, but I think Jack, you're bringing up the recount, the margin here in Pennsylvania uh, hasn't been triggered for-, yeah, for The margin for in Pennsylvania is 0.5% uh, of the total vote has to separate, uh, less than 0.5% has to separate the two candidates. And right now, uh, I think it's 0.9%. Uh, so there would not be a recount in Pennsylvania unless the Trump challenges succeeded in getting a lot of votes thrown out that are currently for Biden. Uh, there is a recount in Georgia where the trigger is uh, that allows a recount is 0.5%. Uh, 
uh, and, and the current margin is 0.3% there. And uh, in Wisconsin, which has a 1% trigger or threshold allowed, uh, the Trump campaign has requested a recount. So really there's only two of the six critical states where the recounts can figure at the moment. Uh, and the other, Pennsylvania, we haven't got near the trigger. And in some of the others, it would be uh, impossible to have a recount under the state provisions. Uh, candidate wouldn't demand one. So uh, recounts by themselves are not going to flip the result, although they could contribute depending what happens in Georgia and in Wisconsin. But the other thing to say about recounts is they very rarely change very many votes. Uh, if a recount changes a few hundred votes, that's quite remarkable. I think I know of one case where it changed a bit more than a thousand votes on a statewide basis. Well, all these states have much bigger margins than that. In Georgia, it's currently around 14,000, Wisconsin, 20,000 votes, and Pennsylvania, about 60,000 votes. So it's yeah. highly unlikely that a recount will change anything, but you never know. Yeah, so uh, about recounts also and about audits, we got a really good question about the investigate or the foe, I call it the foe investigation by the PA General Assembly. Um, but I just wanna mention, we all at the league, we understand about the new machines, uh, right? So the new voting machines that have a paper trail, thank goodness. Um, and election security. So because of that new Act 77 uh, guideline, we do risk limiting audits in Pennsylvania. So it's very hard, but I think people are getting this, that what may happen in Georgia is not applicable to Pennsylvania, right? We have our own election code and our own way, uh, whether it's recounts, so how they're hand counting every ballot, um, they administer elections differently than Pennsylvania. And then as we also know, within Pennsylvania, each of the 67 counties administers their own elections. Uh, so people are getting a civics lesson, which uh, I love as, as a leaguer and, and an elections lawyer, like people are getting an inside look to understanding how our elections are administered. Uh, but the audit, that risk limiting audit, it's very similar to cutting a deck of cards and taking uh, a sample. And so that will be done. It was done in our primary and it overwhelmingly confirmed the results of our election. So this call like this, uh, I've seen this on Twitter, you know, I, and all of you should follow me if you do at Jamie Mogul. I have been tweeting inside election court uh, the most that I can. I, I give legal updates because uh, there's certainly a lot going on in the legal sphere. Uh, but this call for audits and somehow making it seem like there's something you know, nefarious is totally bogus. Uh, we do audits anyway. Um, and again, as Jack mentioned, it's not going to change enough votes uh, for the outcome to change. Um, and even more importantly, um, we got a question about the PA General Assembly uh, and I, I'm sure all of you have looked at the results. GOP won overwhelmingly in the down ballot in the down ballot races. So to to kind of section this off that it's only you know there's fraud and there's only which is not true, but they're saying there's only fraud or it only applies to the presidential election undermines their convincing wins. I mean we're not going to go into gerrymandering and everything else about that. Uh, but it does put uh, this into question, you know, why are you saying you need to audit only the presidential elections when the GOP overwhelmingly won on down ballot races? And so, Jack, we got a question about the PA Gen General Assembly and from Arlene. Thank you, Arlene. And it says the PA General Assembly is investigating what transpired during the 2020 election calling for a legislative, a legislative led audit of the 2020 general election results prior to those results being certified by the Department of State. Is it supposed to be bipartisan? It is supposed to be bipartisan with subpoena power. What impact is this going to have on our state certification? Uh, so I think I talked already about the audit. Um, this is a, This has to actually be passed. Um, they can't just create a committee. They've said they're going to create a committee. Um, maybe, I don't know, Kathy or, or, or Ann, I, as far as I've seen, they put up legislation to create this, but it's a lot, again, of smoke and mirrors. They have this press conference where none of them wore a mask, by the way, in, um, in the Capitol. 
And uh, this to me is a lot of smoke and mirrors to call into question that they can delay the results being certified and somehow uh, change the results again for only the presidential election. Uh, so Jack, do you have anything to add on that about this uh, the legislature overstepping their, their, their bounds? Well, um, it's an attempt. The, the, the Constitution does say that the state legislatures shall decide how the electors are chosen uh, in each state. Uh, and the Pennsylvania legislature, like uh, almost all the others, had said the, all the electors will go on a winner-take-all fashion to the winner of the state popular vote. So that's a state law, which is a statute. So there's one question is whether the legislature alone can intervene to change a statutory fact because the passage of a statute requires the governor's signature as well. Uh, and Governor Wolf certainly isn't going to go along uh, with an upsetting of the popular vote in Pennsylvania. Uh, so, so that's one issue, a constitutional issue, whether the legislature could act alone without uh, in overturning uh, a, a statutory uh, outcome. Yeah. Uh, so it seems unlikely that that would be agreed to. But the attempt of the legislature to intervene in this is because the certifying official, the Secretary of State, is a Democrat. And that's actually true in uh, several of the, the uh, crucial states. It's true in Arizona uh, and in uh, one of the others, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, they have bipartisan boards doing the certification in Wisconsin and Michigan. And in Georgia, there is a Republican Secretary of State, but as you may have noticed, he's come under heavy attack from President Trump and from the Georgia senators uh, for not being sufficiently favorable to the Republicans uh, in the Georgia count, which presumably means he's run a fairly honest election and count. Uh, but the secretaries of state and the, either the fact that they are Democrats in many cases or that they're bipartisan boards is a, a level in the certification that protects the outcome. And uh, it's an attempt to get at that level that the legislative ch challenges have been talked about. Yeah, and I will say we do see, which it shouldn't be because the league is nonpartisan, but we do see this partisan power grab at the different levels. I think we see it playing out in the courts. So I'm just gonna talk, cause we're already at uh, 1236. I'm just gonna, cause we could do just a whole hour on all of the lawsuits that have been filed. Um, and, and I should say off the bat, um, and Anne, you asked a question about recounts. Um, so I'm just gonna address this really quickly. Jack, she asked, when they recount, are they, Ann Bush, uh, when they recount, are they recounting all candidates or just presidential? Uh, it, if it were triggered, and it would have to be for a specific race. So if it's that margin um, that Jack mentioned, it would be for a particular race. It hasn't been triggered here, although Pennsylvania does allow you to petition um, as a candidate, but you have to meet uh, thresholds for that as well. So it it would depend, Anne, is the, is the answer. Uh, so it's not like Georgia where they're counting every ballot. Um, because uh, there's been that margin. Um, and they also have different laws around, around run runoffs, as we know, um, if a race is, is close in a certain way. So uh, here, that's not applicable. But um, getting to the, the legal realm, uh, you know, I've been busy at election court in Pennsylvania, we're an anomaly when we have challenges on election day to, uh, to candidates, to ballots, whatever it may be, the process of administering elections, it goes right to the courts. Uh, so that's why you have election lawyers and you have uh, the cities uh, like Philadelphia or the county solicitors defending their respective election officials. Uh, so I was in Philadelphia election court, it was very busy. It's usually till 10 o'clock at night and the GOP was filing motions um, right up until 10 o'clock. So we didn't actually leave till about midnight on election night. Um, and, the, and the real crux of all of their claims, I think uh, we've seen not really Delaware County, but I live in Montgomery County, which has certainly been uh, a target, Allegheny County and Philadelphia. 
uh, the three largest counties. And as we know, they're primarily Democratic now. Um, so uh, the challenges that were coming in really were baseless. I mean, uh, they even tried to impound machines in the middle of election day, saying that votes are being switched from Trump to Biden. Uh, that did not work out for them. Uh, but the curing, curing, uh, you've probably seen this in the news. Uh, there is nothing under our new reforms, which were passed, by the way, overwhelmingly by a GOP-led legislature. Uh, so they have only themselves to thank them for this. Uh, there's nothing in the code regarding curing. Curing, an example of curing would be, I send in my vote by mail ballot and uh, I forgot my secrecy envelope. We all know about naked ballots. This was something the Trump campaign was successful in suing prior to the election that all ballots had to have both of those envelopes, which overwhelmingly I think people got our messaging. So there weren't a lot of ballots that were missing secrecy envelopes, but this was something we know uh, was an issue. And so uh, counties, which not all of them, but primarily Democratic counties like Montgomery County and Philadelphia, uh, democratically led, were allowing for curing, meaning they were calling the potential voter and saying, you can cure your ballot up until a certain time. Uh, as we know, there are the deadlines that were set, and we'll talk about that the, the extension of that deadline, which is still pending before the Supreme Court. Um, but counties had different means of curing. And so this was something that went to the courts um, and they keep beating it like a dead horse, uh, but it is not expressly prohibited in, in the uh, election code. And thus the, the counties were held by a, and, you know, now this has been appealed all the way up uh, through our courts and our PA Supreme Court notably is democratic. Uh, and the curing process uh, has gone. It's still it's still pending in some Commonwealth courts. There's Commonwealth uh, Court Common Pleas, Commonwealth Court, which is like our appeals court, and then the PA Supreme Court. Uh, so curing was not found to be uh, something that they could cast aside ballots. And it's not just to set aside ballots. I want everybody to know it's to delay the process of counting and canvassing. Uh, and canvassing is that arduous process where you open and you sort and you verify all the ballots. Uh, the real crux was to delay these counties. And we know they have been working 24 seven. Uh, they have invested millions of dollars in counting equipment, even though the GOP led legislature delayed them from starting canvassing till election day. Now all 67 counties, the County Commissioners Association, they ask the legislature, give us more time. Uh, people write to me all the time, what's up with Pennsylvania? What's, why did you only start on election day? Well, thank the, the legislature. The legislature purposely did not extend this deadline. And I think they wanted to create this deadline, you know, this kind of false rhetoric that there's two systems, uh, which is another argument that they've made, that there's somehow two election days, right? There's an election day where you go to vote in person and then there's vote by mail. Um, so I wanna be clear, they're one in the same. It is one full swing election uh, that we had for, for the general election. Uh, so the curing, um, that's something that I think needs to be panned out eventually by the, the legislature. And I know a bill has already been put up about that. Um, so that's the curing. The other big thing is the observers. We've heard a lot about observers and their access. This is also something that changed in Act 77, the new election reforms. Prior to this, you know, it might be like what you think an observer does, like they stand over the shoulder of a tabulator in the canvassing and they're like, I challenge that ballot for failure to, to be a resident, or I, uh, I challenge that ballot for failure to completely fill out the declaration envelope. I'm giving you examples of what a challenge might be. But again, the GOP legislature passed these new reforms and they removed all 
ability to individually challenge ballots. So understand this, they removed in Act 77, the ability to individually challenge ballots beyond 5 p.m. on the Friday before the election. So they're making all these claims that their observers can't see. Now, and I oversee observers, I'm still overseeing them, uh, that report to me and tell me what's happening in the canvassing and, and, the, re and the counting. And what would they need to do, right? Because they can't individually challenge anymore. So again, this is for, I think, for the media, it's for smoke and mirrors. Uh, and when this went to the court, this is also something that's been appealed um, through the various courts. Uh, and it was held by a Republican judge that the six foot distance because of uh, that that was the the line that uh, the observers, which are now not even called observers, they're called authorized representatives. Uh, so they're not even called observers anymore in the count and canvas, uh, and that they had to be within six feet. Uh, but again, they're not looking, nor can they individually challenge ballots anymore. That has been removed after 5 p.m. the Friday before the election. So it's really, you wonder what the hell are they arguing for? Well, what they're arguing for is to find um, process problems. Maybe during the duplication, we saw that Delco was a target of misinformation uh, that they had, they took a screenshot of the tabulators uh, filling in ballots. Duplication is part of our election code. So if you have a ballot that's been ripped or um, as they go through these big machines, sometimes they're sliced um, incorrectly. Um, so you are allowed to re- do a ballot. Um, now, this is part of a process. You're not creating new ballots. Uh, but this is another misinformation campaign and a failure um, of the uh, Trump administration to kind of uh, Trump uh, campaign to kind of bring this to the attention of the courts and claim there's fraud. Now, the uh, on the other hand, we saw in many instances uh, in a case here in Montgomery County, where I am, as well as in the Philadelphia courts, uh, the, the lawyers for the Trump campaign now have said to the court, there is no fraud. I, I, there's really not, not much else I can say to that. They have admitted that there is no fraud. Um, so the curing, the observing, those are two of the, the big things. And so Jamie, Jamie can I can I ask a question about um, you asked you mentioned challenging ballots. And um, I understand in Delaware County there's a huge challenge to provisional ballots. Okay, yes. Can you talk about that process and what's yeah. going to happen and how who pays for all of this? <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah, so um, yes, actually it's today uh, in 15 minutes, <laughs> uh, the hearing on provisionals, over a thousand were challenged. So because what I was talking about before about individually challenging, that was to all ballots, right? Now we have like hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots that uh, the counties are individually processing, but a provisional ballot is that backup ballot. So many people who did not get their absentee or mail-in ballot, they have the option to go in person to cast a provisional ballot, or if you thought you're registered and you're not on the rolls, but you still want to, you should always, the backup is to always vote provisionally. And these ballots sometimes are not even uh, counted. They're the last counted. They're the last thing we get to. But this is unlike any election. This is the first time we've had really across the board. Um, any person who's registered can vote by mail, again, with these new changes. So provisional ballots, we see thousands and thousands of them, where maybe we would only have dozens in other elections. Um, and so the challenges that were made uh, were probably what GOP was hoping to do in the earlier process where they said their observers needed to be close to uh, the tabulators. Um, and so the, the, it's not just there. I mean, I, uh, the, and who's in its court? There's a board of, the board of elections must go through a process. Each county has their own process for reviewing a provisional ballots. There's also something called partial credit so if I uh, wanted to vote, I'm a Pennsylvania resident and I'm not in my home county, but I fill out a provisional in another county, all of my races other than the local races will be given partial credit. So all of this is reviewed through a series of hearings that 
that, that they must be public. So uh, the Monco Board of Elections did theirs. Philadelphia has theirs. Um, and Delaware County, I know I put out a notice to everybody, hey, if you're on this list, make sure you defend your provisional ballot. There is a number you get, so you can track it, like if you did mail-in ballot, how we can track our ballots. You can also check your provisional ballot. Um, and who pays for it? That's a great question. Um, us, the taxpayers, uh, we are paying uh, to defend our elections. So in these hearings, there's uh, usually the city solicitor, uh, there's questions that come to, from the board of elections, which would be your commissioners. Uh, so that's why down ballot races, uh, if you're pissed about how your county runs their elections, know who your county commissioners are and think about that when these races come up. Uh, and so there will be lawyers. Uh, there also will be lawyers from each of the individual party, you know, the parties. Um, and in the cases around here, it's usually the Democratic uh, Party will be supporting the counties and the city of Philadelphia because they're a city as well as um, a county. Uh, so I hope I answer that, but we're paying for it. It's on our dime. It's on our time. And uh, the GOP has made significant um, challenges to all these ballots. I'm just going to close this. I got very bright outside, <laughs> although I like that the sun is out. I want you all to see me. Uh, and uh, the, that's the recount procedure. This was even prior to Act 77. And I think it's great. People are learning what is the process. Um, and certainly it is complicated. And that's I guess why I have a career <laughs> in elections. But Jack, I want to get back to some because we're we have 10 minutes and I think we really want to emphasize the alternatives to the Electoral College and maybe talk about um, no and will the loser pay if it is proven they're wrong? No, absolutely not, which is really unfair. And Bush, good question about provisional ballot challenges. We saw in Montgomery County, uh, over a dozen challenges were made to 4,000 some provisional ballots. And uh, it was a complete waste of time because the GOP was on record saying, their lawyer saying that they withdrew all their challenges. They were applauding the Montgomery County Voter Services staff and the job that they've done um, and talking about how they wanted to enfranchise Pennsylvania voters. So let's hold them to it. Um, but let's get talking about the national popular vote because um, mm. I could talk about the legal challenges. I just want to say there is still one before the Supreme Court regarding the extension of the, the deadline to receipt of uh, mail-in ballots that's still pending. But the bottom line is, even if they found, which they should not under uh, constitutional law, that this election, that those ballots should be tossed out, it would not affect the outcome of this mm -hmm. presidential election. So that is the bottom line and the most important thing to take away from that uh, from that pending case before the Supreme Court. I, I'm wondering if, uh, Jack, do you have anything to say about the national popular vote? Yeah, we're, and... gonna, we're getting to that now. Exactly, Kathy. So Jack, uh, we were gonna talk about some alternatives and the national popular vote, uh, the vote, the interstate compact, I think people should be interested in that. And that is something that the LWV US um, is supportive of. Now, I mentioned at the outset that we wouldn't be involved in any disputes if it weren't for the Electoral College, which puts all the emphasis on just a few uh, cl close states when the overall outcome is not close. Besides which the Electoral College can elect the wrong winner, that is somebody who didn't get uh, the largest number of popular votes. Uh, it could lead to the horrible contingent procedure, which is flagrantly undemocratic. And it also concentrates all the electoral attention on just a few battleground states and leaves uh, most people in the country in so-called spectator states where not much attention is paid to them. So you may say, why do we still have the Electoral College and could we get rid of it? Uh, well, the answer is we can try, and there are two ways to try. The traditional way is to amend the Constitution, which is extremely difficult. Uh, there's a great new book out by a historian at uh, Harvard, Alex uh, Kizar, called Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? And he traces through two centuries of efforts to do away with it, and so far they have not succeeded for reasons that he explains. Now, the other possibility, as many of you know, 
is a, a new idea that came up after the 2000 election called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And this idea exploits the provision in the constitution that state legislatures decide how to choose the electors from their state. Uh, now, 48 out of the 50 states presently have said all our votes go to the winner of our state popular vote. The national popular vote idea is to have state legislatures decide that their votes will go to the winner of the national popular vote. Uh, now, this is not uh, sufficient to have one state or a group of states do this. You need to have enough states that control a majority of the electoral college. So the national popular vote plan takes the form of an interstate compact, which is an agreement among states, a legal agreement among states. Uh, and uh, so each state that passes the, the bill, passes an identical bill, and the law goes into effect only when enough states have joined the compact that they collectively control at least 270 electoral votes. So once that threshold is passed, the winner of the national popular vote will win a majority of electoral votes. So it doesn't abolish the electoral college, but by changing the decision rule in enough states, it will make the national popular vote winner the president in future elections. Now this so, uh, effort. What about here in PA? Weren't you part of a, a push to have that here in PA? Yeah, well, the effort was launched in 2006 and identical bills were introduced in almost every legislature, including Pennsylvania. I did testify on the bill in 2007. Uh, it hasn't gotten anywhere in Pennsylvania, not yet. Uh, the league might wanna do something about that, uh, but it has advanced in other states. There's been slow but substantial progress. And uh, at currently there are 15 states who have joined the compact plus the District of Columbia and together they control 196 electoral votes. So it's only 74 short, 74 votes short of taking uh, effect. And, and we've had some questions about what are the prospects for success of the national popular vote campaign. The main impediment to success is that the question became very partisan, especially after the 2016 election, because Republicans having won because of the electoral college, thought that it generally would benefit them. Mitch McConnell in particular is an adamant opponent of the national popular vote. That belief is actually not true. You can demonstrate that many times Democrats have, have potential benefit from the electoral college, had an advantage because of it, but it was never crucial for them in the way it was in 2000 and 2016 for the Republicans. So just about all the states that have passed the bill are democratically controlled. Uh, and there's only three states left where the Democrats control the both houses of the legislature and uh, the governorship that have not already passed the bill. Those are Maine, Nevada, and Virginia. So I think there's fair prospects that the bill might pass in those three states before too long. It did pass in Nevada, but the Democratic governor vetoed it. it it's passed in one house of the legislature in Maine and Virginia. Uh, but together, those three only had 23 electoral votes, so you still need 51 more. Uh, so for at least the next couple of years and probably beyond, uh, the, the, the compact is not going to succeed unless it can get bipartisan support. There are some certainly states a place where, for the league, Jack, right? Like we know- um, Because we're a nonpartisan organization <laughs> and it would not be seen as so much of a democratic a ploy, but it's something that's beneficial for the country as a whole to avoid these problems of disputed elections, right? Uh, spectator and, states, wrong winners, and the like. So um, somebody asked, because I know we're only three minutes away, mm. uh, we did get a question about would it be upheld if, uh, would there be a court challenge? Um, and the long and the short of it is, it's up to the states. So um, a, a successful challenge about whether uh, this can happen would likely not be uh, a, a good cha a legal challenge. It wouldn't, uh, in my opinion, really go anywhere because this is going through uh, the respective states. Uh, and, and, and I also want to point out that there is a big push, um, the LWV US, so we have our national, we have our state, and then we have our local leagues, which we're all part of these local leagues. Um, and I know our state has played a considerable role. Somebody asked about what is the role of the league. Um, 
our state league has intervened uh, to support our elections, uh, the, the state, the secretary of state, and our respective counties that have been sued by the Trump campaign and the GOP. Uh, so that is a role that our state league plays. I, I was on the state board. I know all about intervening in lawsuits as I was the vice president for government and social policy. Uh, so that is a role of the state league. And then also we at a local level have a very big role, just what we're doing right now, which is informing the public, giving specific information and then lobbying, right? So lobbying, whether it's at the local, the state or the national level, if this is something which I do think people are interested in this uh, national popular vote, uh, this compact, I think there will be a big push. I know there is shortly something coming from the state. I don't want to give it away because it hasn't been officially announced. Uh, but this is something people can get involved with uh, locally to make sure you can uh, talk with your uh, legislature. This is what we do at the league, right? It's not just getting people to vote, but making sure our elections are accessible and fair uh, from the local level all the way up mm -hmm. the ticket. Uh, oh, what a, what a great uh, hope and idea to to express at the end here of this discussion with yeah, you. Yeah, I know we're, we're getting close we didn't get to a lot, but I'm going to put my email and Jack, maybe I'll put your email too. If people have questions, uh, certainly we want to be available to people and get them to, to join the league. Uh, somebody said here, end result, how could Trump win? He's not. <laughs> 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 Jack, I don't know. Do you want to answer that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, the, the chances that uh, his efforts will succeed are very, very minimal. Uh, but the, so. the last question maybe is what happens if he refuses? Um, I actually think that he gets it. I, I'm hoping he goes to Mar-a-Lago for Thanksgiving and never comes back because he is a sore loser. He's taken that to astronomical proportions. And and look, this is not about partisanship when I talk about this. It's, it's bad for democracy. Um, what they're doing is sowing the seeds that our elections are unfair and, and they're the problem. They're the problem. Oh. So yeah, I, I mean, we have a transition of power. We heard about this lawyer who is refusing to release the funds. Uh, behind the scenes, we know all the GOP leadership has already said uh, that they're going to make sure that the Biden transition team has all the documents they need. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also really about the Georgia runoffs um, and to undermine uh, our elections and our democracy. One yeah, thing to be uh, clear about is that the con conceding the election by the loser has really no legal standing. The whole process of certification and casting of the electoral votes and acceptance of those votes by Congress that determines the winner. So the outgoing president uh, doesn't really have a role in that. Of course, he can and is making things uh, work less smoothly. And, and there's the great risk of uh, his inflaming uh, supporters to, to think that the process was rigged uh, and, and to delegitimize uh, the winner. So that's extremely unfortunate, but uh, still it's conceding is, is not gonna, he doesn't have to concede to lose. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, and I know you have some concluding remarks, but this was wonderful. Just wonderful. Thank you for your sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And I totally agree. We could have spent uh, at least another hour on this topic. So we're going to have to bring you guys back, <laughs> uh, especially if this uh, exciting announcement that Jamie alluded to uh, comes to pass. Maybe we can do another program in 2021 uh, on the topic. Uh, it's been... Um, an exciting year in a lot of ways, and it's also a, sort of a, an unsettling year because of COVID, obviously. But uh, Jamie was right. I mean, I think uh, many of us have learned uh, so much through this process leading up to this election. It's been a real civics lesson, and we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. I did want to mention that we are closing uh, our 2020 uh, program uh, year as far as events with two upcoming programs. Uh, the one on uh, Tuesday, November 17th 
is being brought to us by our uh, Civic Education Committee. It's on juvenile justice in the era of the pandemic and BLM for Black Lives Matter. And that's gonna be uh, again, Tuesday, November 17th at noon. Uh, we have one more event uh, for closing out the year. And our irony is it's really an extremely important topic to us here in Delaware County. It's our virtual holiday gathering. Normally that would happen in a place, again, because of COVID, it's a virtual. That's Saturday, December 5th, and it's going to be at 11 a.m. because typically it's a brunch. Uh, so we're saying, you know, bring bring food to eat at the brunch. And it's going to be on uh, the health department. Dr. Monica Taylor, the vice chair of Delaware County Council, is going to apprise us on the progress toward establishing a county public health department. The leagues here in Delaware County have been working on this project for decades. So this is a super important topic uh, to Delaware County and to our leagues. To uh, register for either one of these events or both, you can visit our website at lwvcdc.org. And we want to thank you again for your participation. We had over 80 people register for this event and we will uh, send those people that have registered the link to the recording. So thank you again and we will be stopping the recording. Thanks.